Turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. I love these verses. I really do. <clears throat> There's a, a comic strip that's been, I mean, I saw it when I was a kid, right? And Little Orphan Annie. Do you remember that? Right? Little Orphan Annie. And it was created by a guy. His name is Harold Gray. And it first appeared in 1924. Bob, you remember that day, don't you? It took its name from a, from a poem that was written by uh, James Riley in 1885. And, and the plot that follow, it follows the adventures of this girl named Annie, her dog Sandy, and her benefactor, Daddy Warbucks. Remember that? Good old Daddy Warbucks. Well, the author died in 1968, and other artists were were assigned and hired to keep the strip going, to keep the work going. And it inspired a radio program, two black and white movies, a Broadway musical called Annie, and three major films. And, and, and the, the story about Annie, it's a, it's a story of optimism and, and, and hope and of the surprising turns that life takes and the power of love that softens crusty old hearts. Dave, you remember that, don't you? <laughs> I'm hateful at times. And he teaches us this one thing. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there's going to be sun. You know, the Bible reminds us that we were orphaned because of sin, and we've been separated from our Creator ever since Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. But God finds us where we are and adopts us into his family. What a great story, and it's real. In the book of Second Peter, God has given us great, this is what it says, God has given us great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Some of these promises, first of all, you're stamped with God's image. We've talked about this before. You're an image bearer. When you leave this building, go out and be an image bearer before people, be folks down here in, 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 in greater Orwell. You reflect God's image. And the Bible teaches us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, we reflect God's image. Image. Another promise is that, I love this one, Satan's days are numbered. <laughs> Satan in the word of God is portrayed as a roaring lion. And he works over time in an attempt to take us down with him. Romans chapter 16 says, the God who brings peace will soon defeat Satan and give you power over him. That's a promise. Count on, take it to the bank. And believe it or not, the check is cleared already. Today's promise is this. We are heirs of God. And the key verse here is Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Let me read it for you. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God. And joint, the King James says, joint heirs with Christ. Isn't that good news? Isn't that a wonderful promise? We're heirs of God. We're in the will. But God ain't dying. But we still have ownership of everything that he owns. Everything that Jesus is in possession of is our possession as well. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you bless your word this morning. You've promised that if it goes out, it won't come back empty or void of fruit. Open hearts, open ears, open eyes. In Christ's holy name, amen. Many folks this morning have made a public profession of faith. and We claim to be followers of Jesus. But, you know, we live in a fallen world, don't we, Virginia? We live in a fallen world. This place is messed up. If you haven't noticed that, go out every now and then. And you'll see that we have an issue. This world is in deep stuff. 
We live in this fallen world, and it's easy to forget who we are. It is. That's what we do communion. Jesus said, do this in what? Remembrance of me. Why? Because we forget. We get inundated with so many other thoughts. And, and by the time you get to some place in your life, we were talking about this, the hard drive gets full. And it's easy to forget even important things. This morning, I'd like for us to think about what it means to be his heir and how it shapes the way in which we live. And I'll do that. Remember, again, a good message has how many points? Three. <laughs> this one is no different. It has three points. The first one is, is who we were. Who were we? Romans 8, chapter uh, or chapter 8, verse 14, 15 tells us, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. In fear again. Paul is reminding the Romans what their life was like before they came to Christ. Maybe some of you will remember this. Now they were currently living as God's kids, but before that they lived as slaves. They weren't slaves like to an earthly master, but they were slaves to the power of sin and Satan. That's right. I heard a story about a, a young boy named Joy, Joey. Joey was physically abused by his mother. His father had been in prison all of his life. And his mother was a drug addict. She'd been in and out of county jail. And at times, Joey was beaten. At times, he was kicked around. And many days, he spent locked up in a closet for punishment. Finally, child welfare, child protective came in and removed him from the home when his mother was put in not just jail, but prison. And they found foster care for him. And eventually, because he had been removed from his mother permanently, he was adopted by a, a wonderful, loving family. He'd never seen anything or experienced anything like this. And so as a result, he never bonded with his new family. He cried and he begged to go back and to live with his mother. Back a few years ago, a young girl was killed down in Palermo. Do you remember that? The sheriff had come into that house many times, one time uh, taking the father out, and the, and the girl was on the floor holding her father's leg, saying, don't take my daddy away, even though she'd been sexually abused, she had been beaten, she'd go to school with marks. She didn't want to leave that place. Don't take my daddy away. Pretty soon his behavior was disruptive. He became violent. And his siblings, his new brothers and sisters, he was hurting them and beating them. He, he was destroying property. And, and he even abused the cat so much that they had to put the family cat down because he had hurt that, that cat. Although this boy had been rescued from a horrible existence, and even though he had a, now a wonderful family that embraced him and loved him, he wouldn't allow himself to be loved by them. But he found himself still imprisoned to his earthly trauma. He'd become a slave to his previous abuse. I don't know everybody's backstory. Maybe some of you have experienced this kind of physical abuse on that level. But all of us, all of us, definitely on a spiritual level, you were a slave to your spiritual nature. <clears throat> and then you came to Christ and you hooked up with a church family. And, and, and you were embraced by not only the love of God, but the love of a church around you. That even though you've been loved <clears throat> and nurtured, you find it difficult to allow God and even the other believers around you to, to enter in and to love you. The promise that we have 
is a reminder that we are heirs of God. We're children of God, and we can't fully appreciate that unless we understand and remember our life before we came, became children of God. Once upon a time, we were all slaves to sin, addicted to the schemes of Satan, but that was before Jesus set us free. You have been set free, and now you're a child of God. You got your name in the book. Number two, we've just heard how or who we were. Now, this point is who we are currently, right now. Our theme verse is Romans 8. Now, verse 17, now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. A, a church that we administered at many, many years ago in a place called Cherry Log, Georgia. Cherry Log, Georgia. Dr. Fred Craddock, he was not only the pastor of, ch of this church, but he was a, uh, a, a professor at a local university, and he had authored several books. He and his wife were vacationing in Tennessee, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they just wanted to get away. They needed a respite, a time away from everything. And so they were in this little town. They found a, a little restaurant, a quiet little place. They went inside, sat down, and placed their order. I love little those places, you know, in the hills and those switchbacks around there. Man, you almost smell the barbecue right now, can't you? And there's always a little creek flowing it back. They went inside, and while they were in there, and after they had placed their order, they saw this, this older gentleman, white hair, just kind of walking around, going from table to table, just greeting people and just talking with them, and, 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 and Craddock said to his wife, I hope he doesn't stop here and bother us, but he did. When he found out that Craddock was in the ministry, he said, I've got a great story for you. You're going to love this. So he pulled out a chair. Don't, don't you just love that? When somebody who's, you're trying to have a quiet meal and, you know, you just want you and your bride, your husband, you just want to, just kind of had that time. But they come over and they pull out a chair. You know you got company. Well, he pulled out a chair, he sat down, and he started to tell them a personal story. He said, I was born in these mountains. I had a wonderful mother, but I never knew my dad. And while the Craddocks ate their food, the older man continued to talk. He said, today it's no big deal to have not known your father. But when I was a child, things were different. I was teased. At times I was shunned. And he said, people made fun of me because I didn't have a father. I was different. And the old man said that when he became a teenager, the church that he went to uh, had a new pastor. But he didn't want the new pastor to know anything about him. So what he would do is, he said, I'd arrive late. I'd sit in the very back. And then before it was all over, maybe during the benediction, I'd get up and I'd leave. But he said this one day, I kind of dozed off during the prayer. And by the time I woke up, everybody was in the aisle and, and standing up and walking, getting ready to walk out the door. So he said, I got in line. Finally, I got up to the pastor and I had to shake his hand. And the pastor just looked at me and he said, son, who are you? Who's your daddy? Now, when he said that, all the other people around, they knew the kid's story. They knew the back story. And so they turned, and they, they wanted to hear what was going to be said. Well, the pastor was pretty quick, too. So he saw everybody look. He knew there was a back story to all this. So he quickly caught on. He said, wait a minute. I know who you are. I see the resemblance. God is your daddy. You're a child of the king. 
Then the pastor added, son, you have a great inheritance. All you got to do is claim it for yourself. That old man talking to the Craddocks just kind of paused for a minute. And he said, that's the single most important thing, sentence that's ever been said to me. And with that, the old man stood up, smiled, and, and shook Reverend Craddock's hand, and he said goodbye, and he walked away. The server came over to give him their check, and Reverend Craddock said, who was that man? Who was that guy? And the server said, why, everybody knows Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper's the, the governor of Tennessee. I have goosebumps now on both arms. That's a double arm goosebump provider right there. You see, knowing who he was changed Ben Hooper's life. The Bible says that we're no longer slaves to sin. We are children of the king. We are royalty. Just like uh, Randy Alcorn said the other day. He said, I'm royalty because my father's a king. I'm an heir of God. And we need to claim our inheritance. Somebody has said that there are no orphans in heaven. There are no stepkids in heaven. We are all that know him part of God's family. For, <clears throat> for many years after a concert or at the end of a concert, uh, we would sing a song by Bill Gaither, a part of a song, just to end it. And, and it's, it's a Bill Gaither tune, and it goes something like this. So please forgive my voice, you can hear it. And it would go something like, From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family. Yes, yes, yes. What great singers you are. <clears throat> you know, today in this world with our, with our styles of music and our tunes, the, the song sounds a little corny. Not to me, but I'm sure we couldn't really do it in a youth meeting. But theologically, that song is right dead on. You know, there are two ways to enter a family. You can be born into a family, but being born into a family, you can't, you can't choose when you're going to be born. You can't choose who you're going to be born as, and you can't choose the family you're born into. But we do choose whether we love and honor our family. The second way is through adoption. Adoption. I've experienced this. First John 3, 1, the old apostle writes, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. A church that we used to, we've ministered at so many churches, Sonny. We, we really have. In Indiana, it was pastored by uh, 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 David Stokes. Dave told me we were just chatting together in his office. He told me that he was adopted, and he had never, ever met his birth mother. He'd never looked for her. He really had no interest in finding his birth mother. And it wasn't because he was bitter. He didn't know her. He, he couldn't talk badly about her. And he thought she probably had whatever the reasons were. He just didn't know. But because the man and the woman raised, that raised him, they loved him. They raised him, and they were his mother and his father. 
as the adopted children of God, we are heirs. And that gives us the right and the privilege to call God this, Abba. There you go. You're way ahead. You've seen this already, haven't you? Did I send you all a copy of this? Abba, that's the Aramaic word for daddy, for daddy. You know, I said earlier that I've had, when I was a, uh, just a, a young kid, uh, um, you know, in elementary school, I had a nickname. They called me Green Bean. They did. We all had nicknames. When I went into high school, I had a nickname. They called me Pie. I don't know where that came from, I, I don't, but they called me Pie. You know, and again, when Emma was born, and as time went along, she started calling me Poppy. And now to my our grandkids, I'm Poppy, every one of them. And, and so, what a precious name, but I'll tell you what, the name that I appreciate probably the most is the, the word Daddy. Daddy. Uh, our three sons are all adults. Our oldest is 45. 45. I told, I told Chris the other day, our middle son, I said, you know, when I look in the mirror and I see, you know, you just see changes. What do you do? And, you know, and I see every now and then I find a gray hair. <laughs> what? Bill, can you believe these people? Did you? <laughs> but I, I told Chris, I said, I don't feel old. But when I look at you guys and I see you're getting gray hair, I feel old. That's, that's just it, right? And, and so Abba, Father, what a very tender word, a word of per, uh, personal tenderness. It's a t term of endearment. In the book of Romans, the Bible says, Paul said, the spirit you received brought about your adoption, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Isn't that great? We can call the creator of everything Daddy. Now, to us, it seems kind of kind of light, kind of easy. But that word Abba, that's what it means. It's, it's a personal uh, term, a personal type, Abba. In some way, I think uh, Spanish, maybe. I don't know Spanish, but uh, you remember Mark Gibson, right? He's, he's ministered here before. Uh, just after the service, we're going to meet him down in Syracuse, he and Debbie, his wife, and, and we're going to have lunch with him. And their, some of their grandkids call, them, call her Abby, which must be the feminine side of, da, uh, you know, of Abba. Right? I don't know Spanish, so I can't say that for sure. But Abba's the voice of the child who calls for her daddy when she wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning because of the threat of the boogeyman. Right? I heard about a little girl. She began to cry one early morning. She called her daddy, I'm thirsty, daddy. The father patiently, he had to get up in a couple of hours to go to his job. But he got up and he walked to the kitchen. He got his little girl a glass of water. Then he kissed her and he tucked her back in the bed and said goodnight again. Several minutes later, she began to cry again. I'm thirsty, she said. And so he got up and he got her a second drink of water and tucked her again into bed. Well, a few minutes later, she began to cry again. This time the father's kind of, he's a little bit more impatient. And he, and he kind of snaps and he said, you've already had two drinks of water. If you get thirsty again, I'm going to come in and give you something to get thirsty about. <laughs> now go back to sleep. Well, about five minutes pass by. That little girl hollers out, Daddy, when you come in to give me something to get thirsty about, would you bring me a glass of water again? Before Christ, we were slaves to sin. And once we fell into a sinful lifestyle, we just couldn't stop ourselves. We couldn't do it. Kind of like we've all heard the story of the pig, right? Right? Uh, it, you, if you go out and you get a pig at a big old farm, you know those big old pigs? Hogs, right? 
you've been out west, right? They are big. And if you ever have to, if you have to park your, your, your bus next to a farm, close the windows. <laughs> They're worse than a chicken farm. But, but say you went out and you got a big old pig that had been covered in mud, and you, you hose it off real good, and you get under its arms and in its belly, and then you bring it inside, and you put it in a soapy you know, a tub of water, and you wash it real nice, and, and you get it so nice and clean, and, and then you put some cologne all over it, right? And then you bring in a, an expensive tuxedo. And you dress that pig up in that tuxedo. Wow, it looks like it's getting ready to go to a, a prom or something. But I guarantee you, if you open a door, that pig is going to run out and do a cannonball in the first mud pile it sees. That's what we were. We couldn't help ourselves. But God, praise his name, sent his son to become our savior, our redeemer, our justifier. And he adopted us into his family. And what is his is now mine and yours. The first adoption recorded in the Bible, anybody know? Moses. Moses. Pharaoh was becoming threatened by the increasing population of the Israelis in Egypt. So he, he pulled this thing off, kind of like a Herod deal, where he's going to now kill all these children, these newborn male children. He's going to exterminate them. So the mother of Moses, what she did is she fashions a, a, a waterproof uh, a basket, and she puts Moses in it and puts him in it and, and puts him in the Nile. Well, to us, that sounds just as dangerous, but she figured he had a better chance in the Nile than he had with the Pharaoh. Well, you know, God does what he wants to do. God had a plan. And that basket of a baby, a baby in a basket, sounds like a lunch at, you know, no, never mind. Baby in a basket with fries, right? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe to a crocodile in there, I don't know. But the baby's floating down and kind of gets caught in the, in the bulrushes. And guess who finds him? Actually, it was a servant girl, but uh, we're going to say Pharaoh's daughter because he, he was turned over to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter found him, adopted him as her own, and raised him in the palace. And God's plan was this, that that Moses, that young baby was going to grow up and lead God's people out of Egypt and to the promised land. Another adoption took place, a woman by the name of Esther. How many have heard of Esther? You've heard of Esther. When Esther's parents died, she was adopted by, anybody know? Mordecai. It was an older cousin. And, and he, he loved that little girl as if she was his own. And she grew up, became a fine woman, and she married King Xerxes. King Xerxes. And she became queen of the Persians. And according to God's plan, in that position, she was able to save the Jewish race from a holocaust, from extinction. One more, Second Samuel, David, King David, right? The same guy with the sling, right? The same guy that I can imagine when he's getting ready to, to, to cap Goliath. And everybody's saying, he's too big to fight. And David's going, he's too big to miss. <laughs> and miss he did not. David's king now. And he sees or he hears about the grandson of King Saul, who's now gone. And the son of Jonathan, Saul's son. This young man's name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, at the age of five, had, had, had dropped from the arms of a nurse and had damaged his legs, and he was now a disabled for life. He was crippled, and he was living in poverty. David heard about him and came to him and took him into the, into the palace. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, Mephibosheth lived in the palace, ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He was adopted 
into the family, and he now had the benefits as an heir of the king. Paul wrote to, to the Corinthians in his second letter, and he reminded them of God's grace. He said, God, I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters. That's God's promise to you, and you know all about you, and God still takes you in. Point number three, who we were, who we are, now who we will be. Our verse 817 now, if we are children of his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. In some cultures, the, the idea of adoption carries with it the, the idea of being a second-rate citizen, a second-rate status. But that wasn't so in the first century with the Romans. In the Roman culture, an adopted child had great prestige, great position, even great power, even more so than a biological child, because the adopted had been chosen. You know, the child that you get when, when a child is born, you know, sometimes you, you hear it all the time. Uh, is it a girl or a boy? I, I don't know. I don't care. I just want the child to be healthy, right? That's what we all want, just a healthy child. But when you have an adopted child, you pick that one out. You pick that one out. Reverend Alan Smith, he sang at a church in Spring Lake, North Carolina. And the story goes like this. A new family moved to town, and when VBS rolled around, the parents that had just moved into that town were registering their children, three sons, for VBS. But something just didn't add up. All the birthdays, all the, all the boys were the same age. And all their birthdays were in the same month. And they were all the same age. And so the pastor was talking to him, and he said, how'd you do this? They're not triplets. And they weren't born on the same day or even the day after the day before. How'd you do this? Well, the father and mother were there, and the three boys were there, and the father said, my wife and I had had many miscarriages, and we were told we couldn't have children, kind of like us. So we went to an adoption agency, and they happened to tell us that there were two women, two young women that were expecting children, and they had just found out that they were pregnant. And the father, or the man and woman said, we'll take them. Now, they were well known in their community. They had already been vetted, already security checks and everything that needs to take place. And so they were fast laning this through. Well, about a week later, they went to the doctor and they found out that better be Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just seemed funny at the time. Tell her I said hi. About a week later, the man and woman went to their doctor and found out that this woman was pregnant again, right? And they said, you know, the doctor said, you know, you've had so many miscarriages, do, do you want to end this? And they said, oh, no. Let's follow it through. Well, so now they've got two kids that they're planning on adopt, adopting that are going to be born pretty close the same day. And now she's pregnant, but she's had five or six miscarriages. But what month one goes by. The baby is still hanging on for dear life. Month two, the baby is like padlocked itself to the door. Month three goes by, and it's like a protest at a university. I'm staying here. <laughs> month four, month five, and they're going into month six, and the doctor says, I think this one's going to make it. 
and they follow through. And they get to month nine, and these two other little children are born. They're both boys. Two different families now coming into one family. And about a week later, their biological child, a boy, is born. I have goosebumps again. And so there's an understanding. And the father said, well, which one is the biological son? Which one? And one of the boys just kind of interrupted, and he said, we don't know because dad says he can't remember anymore. <laughs> These boys, though one is bi biological and two are adopted, are brothers. That's the way it is in our family. They're our heirs. They're not getting anything. And they're co-heirs, just like we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus. And what's his is ours. I heard about an, an attorney who had been hired to find a, a missing heir. And the heir stood to inherit $120 million. They wanted to find this person. And so the head of the agency said, I'm going to put my best detective on this case. She's young and smart and ambitious. Two weeks later, the attorney receives a call from the female detective. Good news, she said. I found the missing heir. And naturally, he wanted to know where he was. And she said, he's with me in Las Vegas. We'll see you just as soon as we get back from our honeymoon. <laughs> as God's adopted kids, we share the same inheritance as the only begotten Son of God. <clears throat> Linda and I have a joint checking account. You know what that means? I can go write a check for the full amount of whatever's in our account as long as I no longer want to be married. Well, there's not much there, so she doesn't have to worry about anything. <clears throat> Let me wrap this up. Just before he died, Joshua is rehearsing God's covenant with Israel. He talks about their journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. He reminds them that, that even though their fathers had been faithless, that God is still with them. And he had brought them to Canaan. And he tells them that God ha has fought for them. And he's delivered them. He said, I delivered Jericho into your hands. He said, I drove them out. You didn't. You didn't have to use your swords or your bows. I gave you land in which you didn't have to toil. I gave you cities that you didn't have to build. And you were able to eat from vineyards and olive groves that, that you didn't plant. And so he says through Joshua, so choose this day who you will serve. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Final thing here. Uh, a commercial aircraft, Flight 93, crashed in a Shanksville, Pennsylvania field on that fateful day of 9-11. One of the passengers on Flight 93 was a man by the name of Sonny Garcia. And his wife, Dorothy, desperately wanted just one thing, if they found anything, just one thing if they could find it, and it was the wedding band that he had. She told the authorities that there was an inscription, and on it it said, all my love. And the date was August 2nd, 1969. Three months later, on December 19th, two men, two officers appeared at her door with a small white box. And inside there were four items, his wallet, Sonny's wallet, a baggage claim ticket, his driver's license, and as you might suspect, a wedding band. And she could still 
even after that horrific crash, still read the inscription. President Trump would say at the dedication of the memorial to the brave people on that plane, I quote, those words, all my love, echo across this plane, and they shout, all my love. At Calvary, Jesus said, all my love. And it was written in red in the color of his shed blood for you and me. Those words tell the story of a God who gave himself in order to adopt you. And you know you. To adopt you into his family. With all of the benefits as an heir. And a joint heir with Jesus. Folks. I end with, it's time for us to claim our inheritance. Amen. Let's pray together. Father.